Hi, I'm Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us both online and in person. We are in conversation with Dokun Issa, president of World Uyghur Congress. Welcome to RightsCon. Thank you. A few housekeeping notes. Um, post your questions online. This is why I have my laptop here. I'll be posting and looking, not posting, I'll be looking at your posts, uh, your questions on Slido. And um, we don't have a, you know, a, a Q&A uh, section at the end. I'll just keep glancing. So if we're talking about something and you want to just jump in with a question, just do it. I will keep my eye on it. So with that, I want to just um, introduce you just a little bit more to our audience. Um, you were born in Aksu in what the Chinese government calls Xinjiang yes. and what many Uyghurs consider East Turkestan. East Turkestan yes. You were educated as a physicist in China and studied English and Turkish in Beijing. Uh, and very quickly, because of your free thinking, ran into trouble with the Chinese government. Uh, and eventually, I mean, just to make a long story short, you had to leave and then end up in Turkey and then onward to Europe where you have worked to advocate for the human rights of the Uyghur people to bring attention to the mass detention of Uyghurs and other minorities in China uh, that have been documented by many journalists in um, recent years. And of course, you are also the author of The China Freedom Trap, so we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, because this is RightsCon and we look at the intersection of human rights and technology, can you just give us an idea of the kind of surveillance people in China are experiencing these days, the Uyghurs? You know, it's China's government since the 2000, end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017 locked on more than 3 million Uyghur and the Kazakh as a uh, Turkish-speaking people in the 21st century concentration camp. Before this uh, opening of the concentration camp, Chinese government started 2014, 2015, testing all surveillance technology, particularly facial recognition and the voice recognition, this technology, testing for the Uyghurs in Turkestan. Then, uh, and, the, and more than 11 million people's DNA test, China's example. Then, several and all Uyghurs, the uh, Chinese government not only used the, the advantage of the technology today to use several and the Uyghurs, but also same time in person, in the classic way, and the plus is ad, and the, so, uh, digital technology. Mm. And 2014, before, turn into several land technology and several land system to, in, in the Turkestan to the Uyghurs, China and use and the classic way and use the in, in person several land system. For example, in Urumqi, capital of the Turkestan, Urumqi, uh, 2016 August, Ching Chang who was the former party secretary of Tibet. Yes. He appointed party secretary in Urumqi, in the Turkestan, then he whole region turned into an uh, opener present. For example, in Urumqi, only one city, he set up 960 checkpoint. Checkpoint. It all is over me, the city. So all going city. from one neighborhood to another. Ex of course. And, and this Chinese uh, party official had been in Tibet previously, so he took what he learned in terms of surveilling the Tibetans, and then he was transferred to do the same he, and He more. used his experience from Tibet, mm. then used in the Turkestan. Mm. You know? So that's why not only from one city to another city, even, even one city, each, it is mean 960 and checkpoint, it is mean every two, 300 meter one checkpoint. I mean, I've been to Remchi. It's a, 960 is a lot of checkpoints in that city. Yes. So then later, and that since 2016, 2017, Chinese government testing surveillance technology, digital technology. Mm. Then now is China remove all the checkpoint. All these checkpoint exist from the one city to another city, but in the city area, nearly no checkpoint because all every area, every apartment, every citizen in front go out in, into the door, out door, the surveillance by the digital technology. So it is mean Chinese government already turned whole the region, whole Turkestan, open air prison. Surveillance everyone, every moment. And the besides 2017, Chinese government also they are reported more than one million Chinese Communist Party cadres to the Uyghur family. C cadres, yeah. Cadres, yeah. yes. And they sent to the Uyghur family and the monitoring of 24 hours. So you have a situation where 
Chi the Chinese government is using techno surveillance combined with old fashioned 20th exactly. century human surveillance exactly. and also that a Soviet model, the, the old Chinese communist model, many people might have read about and might even be familiar with, which is, you know, neighbors informing on each other, keeping, you know, a pair of eyes and looking and following people. Yes, yes, what, uh, 24, you monitor 24, you sleeping together, same bed, mm -hmm. and what do you eat? What did, did you do? Mm -hmm. Every moment, even your um, emotion as well. Right and the monitoring and the, uh, yes, yeah, so monitoring every time. So I also then want to expand beyond the borders of China and ask about surveillance of Uyghurs outside of China, because it seems like the Chinese state is doing that as well. So you well, live in which, which country? I'm living in Germany. Right. Yes. And have you had experiences where you feel like someone is following you? Or? Well, yes. It is um, one of the good examples mm -hmm. of the Chinese transnational repression against Uyghurs and particular Uyghur activists. I'm beside of the despite of the German citizen, I had faced I and uh, faced to deport to China. I was feeling since the 26 years. I was feeling not um, feeling free. You know, everywhere I'm going, Chinese, I can see the sign of the Chinese long arm. So for uh, so many country border, I was detained, for example, 2009, when I was invited to one of the international human rights conference. Mm -hmm. I was invited, I went to the South Korea. When I entered the border, policy stopped me. And, and in the four days, four days, I had faced to nearly deported to China, despite the German citizen, you know. Yeah, and because of the precious State Department, German Foreign Ministry, European Union, uh, very, very last minute, I was deported to Germany. And you're just one case. I mean, just in case people don't know, I mean, there is a lot of pressure that the Chinese government places on other nations to deport Uyghurs within their boundaries and, and, and borders. And we've seen cases where Uyghurs have been successfully deported back to China yes. and... Uh, pretty much never heard from uh, again. Yes, yeah, so, so, and uh, so, so many uh, international human rights organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch reported, even Uyghur Human Rights Project last year published one report. Mm -hmm. So far, is documented case. Undocumented case, we don't know because some country is hiding it, secret is deported. More than 1,100 Uyghurs uh, de re refugees mm -hmm. deported different of country because of Chinese recruits to China. That's a lot. Yeah. And, and you talk about surveillance, transnational surveillance. Do you worry about your digital safety, your phone? How often do you get your phone checked to make sure there's no um, surveillance tools that have been, you know, yeah. added somehow? <laughs> Yeah, China's, China is the, uh, for example, my, I'm president of World Uyghur Congress. My organization is website time to time uh, hacked. It is very usual, this issue. You know, even sometimes we couldn't find any hosted domain uh, company mm -hmm. because of the, any company hosted for our domain. Mm -hmm. Then immediately so many millions of attacks to this companies and company as no, 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 we cannot host for you. We had really difficult to find as a hosting company as it's well. It's too something. costly for hosting companies in democracies to support you. Yes, yes. So, and the, then, of course, and all email, several and email attack and also and the hacks or attack on telephone mobile phone you know and the china is today is really used technology trying to us you know, and influence with daily life you know mobile phone home telephone sometimes 2009 is uprising was happening that time my mobile phone my home phone and my office phone and the, and in the ringing Non-stop ringing. You pick up the telephone, mm. no one pick up. Wrong. C couldn't work. Even we reported to the telecom company. They are searching, but they couldn't find the way. And we reported the German police as well. Mm. And you have to protect us because which phone is real phone? Which phone is fake with on? Non-stop ringing, 24. That's why they take out the so line. So you were being harassed during that time, even yeah. though you were in Germany. Now, in terms of uh, surveillance, um, I just want to ask you, there's a, there are a lot of surveillance cameras in London, right? There are a lot of surveillance cameras in yes. New York City. What makes surveillance 
in China with the same technologies different? Of course, and in Europe, London, the rest of the world, there is a lot of surveillance uh, camera. But this uh, surveillance camera is uh, protecting the right of the civilian. And, uh, you know, because security, because of your safety. But in China, completely the, uh, opposite. China is this uh, surveillance technology, surveillance camera, monitoring your movement. Particularly this, particularly in Turkestan, this surveillance camera recognize in the, some special tool, spe special software, recognize ethnicity. Look at your eyes and horn. Oh, this is the Uyghurs or Kazakh. Then is this the following you. So that's why China, this is the big difference. I mean, there, there are some activists who are concerned about the abuse of surveillance cameras in, in, in Western countries, too. I mean, I just want to highlight that because I'm sure there will be people who yes. will point that out. Uh, can you talk to us about your book? Why is the book titled The China Freedom Trap? <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is a good question. Of course, my book is a, a freedom trap in China. Why? Because as I, I said at the beginning, I'm a German citizen. I went to exile 1994. Since the 19, uh, 29 years, I'm in the exile. Since the 1996, I'm living in Germany. I'm seeking political asylum. Since 2006, I'm, I'm the cit uh, citizen, German citizen. Mm. But despite of the German citizen, I was not feeling free. Because as I said at the beginning, I detained so many country border. All my experience in the book was not happening in authoritarian country. Was not happening in China, was not happening in Central Asia or so, so, some other country. Most of the, my experience was happening in the democratic countries. Germany, I was detained in Germany. I was detained in the Switzerland, in the Geneva, in front of the United Nations. I was detained in the United States even, 2006, when I was arriving. And I was detained also in uh, Italy, for example, 2017. And the middle of Europe, this is happening. So this is all my experience was happening in the free world, not authoritarian countries. Yes. And this is a failure then of de democratic states to protect people. Yeah, it is. It is because, of course, and China trying to blame me as a terrorist, you know, and put my name on the Interpol red notes. And uh, actually, China... So they've weaponized Interpol? Yes, weaponized. Okay. Misuse Interpol. China misuses all international organizations, unfortunately, particularly misuse Interpol. So 1997, Chinese put my name to the Interpol is criminal and a killer. That time, Chinese government uh, didn't use a label of terrorist for the Uyghur movement, separatist or religious fundamental, something not like. Up September 11, terrorist attack 2001, Chinese government turned the language immediately within one night because we are Muslim. And at that time, Western media and the t uh, Muslim Islam is a put same t territory. Chinese government, how it is good, perfect uh, time perfect the, uh, chance, opportunity to, uh, 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 against the Uyghur people. Then within one night, all the Uyghur being terrorists since September 11th. So they, the Chinese government took advantage of uh, the United States policy post 9-11, yes. used the language, the same language. Exactly. And used it to target, target your people. Uyghur, yes. Then in 2003, and, and I put my new label, the mm -hmm. terrorist. 2003, uh, December, Chinese government issued a long list, 11 people, and the four Uyghur organization official a terrorist. I mean, but what is your crime? What does the Beijing government say you have done? And what be have you really done? Yeah, for me, is before 2011 uh, uh, September terrorist attack, Chinese government blamed me as a killer and the uh, killer and the criminal, criminal, established criminal gang. Up September 11, Chinese government blamed me as a terrorist. Yes. And all you've been doing is talking about human rights. Of course, because all my human, my life, I have never, I have never killed any chicken. You know, but Chinese government accused me the killer and the terrorist because Chinese government trying to stop my activism. Chinese government doesn't want the Uyghur issue being one of the international issue because I'm um, the, the other activist. I'm the uh, I'm the, uh, the uh, pro democracy uh, leader of the pro student pro democracy movement 1980s. So 
I'm trying to raise awareness. I'm attending international uh, conference, United Nations, and different of countries. Chinese government really didn't happy for this, and Chinese government used this blame as a terrorism, trying to block my activism, and the, uh, trying to block the Uyghur issue being one of the international uh, inter international issue. Uh, yeah, this is that's why Chinese government trying to use all language, use all capacity and misuse all international uh, organization uh, trying to stop me and Uyghur activism. And you, you mention a lot of countries you've been to where you've encountered problems. You travel a lot, and you travel a lot because of your advocacy work. And I understand yes. that you've been traveling a lot in South America. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about why you've been traveling in this region? Well, uh, you know, is so far we are I traveling, my colleague traveling to the North America, Europe, different of the Middle East, Middle, Mid, uh, Middle East countries. But in the Latin American country, global source, but not only Latin America, global source, Latin America and then African countries, and the Chinese has strong influences, this, this continent, global source. And uh, last year, was October, uh, we have seen clear evidence on this. In the U UN Human Rights Council, uh, and the Uyghur resolution uh, was filed because 19 countries support China, 17 countries uh, support this resolution on Uyghur resolution. Most of some countries in 19 countries is a global source. Very few of this country support this resolution. Most of them silence, abstain, or support China's uh, proposal, China's side. So Latin American country, most of them, member of Human Rights Council, is abstain and uh, and today is abstain today is silence of ongoing genocide it is a complicity of the genocide you know so that's why we are traveling to the latin american country and because china trend continually uh, spread fake news mis huge um, misinformation campaign and some countries they really believe and uh, believe the Chinese propaganda. So that's why we're traveling this country. I'm the victim of this Chinese genocide because my mother died in concentration camp. My brother is uh, sentenced to life. And I'm only, I have, I'm not only the activist, and I'm also victim of the today's Chinese uh, genocidal policy. So that's why I, I and my team visiting the Latin American country. We are meeting, uh, trying to convince foreign affairs uh, uh, foreign Office, uh, Minister of Foreign Office, and we, we had a meeting in the civil society, NGOs, media, uh, lawyer, policy maker. We are rise awareness first. Yes, that is the uh, purpose we are visiting. I mean, there are actually quite a lot of participants from the Global South at RightsCon, and often I do pay attention as a reporter uh, based outside of the United States um, to hear what the voices of the Global South have to say. And one of the things that seems to me quite tough to square is that many countries in the global south talk about the need for rights, the need for equity, the need for fair treatment, and at the same time support China. It seems very hypocritical to be talking about human rights and representation and because of their, frankly, I understand the history of American adventurism, a lot of people are, are, are not, you know, do not have positive views of the United States. Exactly. But because the, of the narrative of, that's been set up of U.S. versus China, if you don't like the United States, then you must be pro-China, which I find illogical and problematic. I mean, it must be very frustrating to, to deal with so many people speaking from the global south who are friendly to china and seem to ignore willfully the human rights evi the evidence of human rights violations against uyghurs yeah so uh, during the all uh, latin american global south country we also uh, got some experience because it's a very new area for us mm -hmm. this is a first visit for us so this uh, trip and uh, provide uh, us to get some experiences how we can deal with the people
you know, how, and it is also uh, provide us the opportunity to understand the mentality of the, uh, and the Latin American peoples, government, civil society, what is the different government in civil society. So we got very good experience with, uh, despite so, of, yeah. You had a positive experience then? Yes, we got positive experience. Of course, governments have very close with China. Uh, they have all country have a uh, very close trade relationship with China. Actually, not uh, global source, entire world. Globally. Including the United Every States. Country. Even the United right. States. Despite the United States government and Congress mm -hmm. uh, recognize Uyghur genocide, mm -hmm. despite still in the, a lot of uh, business with China. Mm -hmm. Even Ch UN United States has uh, Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act, still as the uh, business increasing. Yeah. So this is a natural, but however, during our visit in the, uh, Latin America, we have seen there is strong potential, strong, and NGOs, civil society have strong power. They have strong impact. And the media is very uh, independent, yeah. independent, because uh, I, I, we have seen, when I was in the, uh, um, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, Sao Paulo, uh, Blatt have an interview along me, Chinese uh, embassy calls this newspaper, don't publish this interview, you know, can't use this, but they are, they are published, and the next day, Chinese ambassador and uh, uh, publish another open against me and our trip. So, however, and we are traveling to the Argentina, Chile, this all we have uh, met a lot of media. Media cover on this, civil society and the uh, bar association, for example, is a very, very, very strong. So, uh, we are hopeful. This is the first, first trip. But we are very successful. We are, of course, we have to continue. We have got some experience. We have to do something. We rise over this. I believe, and we are, we, I'm very optimistic, we can find some supporter from the uh, Latin America. That's great to hear. Um, and also, when you are face to face, I mean, I imagine that most people you met have never met someone who is Uyghur. And, and when they meet someone for the first time, it becomes no longer an abstract concept, but a real, real issue. Yes. Right? So it's very important to me. There is a question, so I want to ask. Um, someone has wants to um, know what can civil society activists and organizations do to better support your advocacy on the issue? So how can people in uh, this room help? Yes, it is a good question. Of course, this, uh, the people in this room can do a lot for ongoing. Today, Chinese government commit genocide crime against the humanity. So, no, it is good enough evidence. Uyghur tribunal and uh, have collected 100,000 page document and uh, uh, camp survivors today in talking about uh, their experience in the concentration camp experience to the international media. So the, uh, the people who live in here, human rights activists can do a lot. Still a lot of people don't know but because we don't have a such big capacity to travel around the world, for example, Latin America, no Uyghur community, no Uyghur organization. You know, there are no Uyghur diaspora, no, no in, Uyghur diaspora in South America. So that's why we can only help this civil society, so the people who come from this global source, they can do something. As a human rights defender, as a, as a, as a, as a uh, people can do something. Rise awareness, you know, talking and the write a uh, letter to the policymaker, parliament member, pressure to the government. And uh, yes, so, and also another issue today, uh, forced labor is slavery. Uh, slavery yes, work. It is one of the important of uh, right. and uh, critical issue among the Uyghur have been faced. So, still a lot of people even they don't know. Yes. Today is a 25 percentage global cotton textile from Uyghur forced labor. Maybe most of some people don't know. In China, 85 percent cotton from the Uyghur forced labor. You know. So maybe quite a lot of people today wearing the clothes. Maybe they don't know, but they are already complicit of the forced labor. Because you know? most people don't know that a yes, lot of the know. world's cotton for, for making fabric comes within the borders of China yes. from the region where you're from. Yes, exactly. So that's why you should be before buying something for today, so many electronic, you know, and a lot of products. And it's a direct link or indirect link with the forced labor. Should before buying anything, should be checked. This because very easy, a world Jewish uh, watch already and uh, and the published one database mm. uh, a couple of months ago. If you put 
the name of the company mm. immediately and show you this company, this, this product, have a direct link with the Uyghur first ever. Then boycott, don't buy in Chinese production. Because if you buy in Chinese production, it is the contribution for the Uyghur first ever. Yeah, so that's why the people who live here, because I have seen uh, a lot of human rights activists, people and the, the, from different of, uh, area, is a very influential goal, a politician, activist, all. They can do something for us after return to, to origin, home, home, home country. And uh, yeah, use social media, different of way. And you, you've talked about what civil society can do in answer to that question. What can corporations do? Well, cooperation and the, then cooperate, and we are very welcome to the cooperate world Uyghur Congress, you know, and some other Uyghur organization. And particularly, unfortunately, we don't have, uh, as I said, an Uyghur community Uyghur organization global source, but it's the United States, Canada, Europe, and different countries have a Uyghur community. Then I uh, strongly recommend them to cooperate with us. Mm -hmm. If they need any information, mm -hmm. we are happy to. To, to, to provide them, and they organize any event and invited us. We can cooperate with them to raise awareness and uh, testimony, yes. But I mean private companies yes. who might be part of the supply chain, what can they do? What do you think you want to see from them? Yes, private company, no, it is not correct time business as usual. Because it is the happening for the Uyghurs, not human rights violation. You're already beyond the human rights violation. 70 years ago, 75 years ago, during the Holocaust, up to the Holocaust, war promised never again, you know? So, but never again is happening again today. In this context, in this situation, this company should be stopped business with China, recommendedly. It is not correct time business as usual, because it's not human rights violation, beyond, because every day people is dying here. So that's why, and the private company, big company, brand, stop business with China. This is the this is the cop, this is the helpful and the other just the condemnation of the Chinese uh, genocidal policy of Uyghurs or just to make statement. It is empty promise playing but not major role to stop playing. So I believe all company have moral obligation to stop ongoing genocide. All government, country, and the member state of UN have a legal obligation to stop ongoing genocide and the crime against the humanity. And you mentioned, um, you know, what happened uh, with the Holocaust. A lot of Jewish groups today have been good allies on, on amplifying this yes. issue. Um, with the remaining time, just a little bit, what are your final thoughts to leave us? Well, my final uh, message and uh, I asking the people should be help us stand with Uyghurs today and uh, should be speaking out at least, first step speaking out and educating the people. We are trying to use our, cap our capacity, trying around the world, rise awareness and, uh, and, uh, and asking the people to cooperate with us, stop ongoing genocide. So I'm asking the people should be stand with us and uh, to do something to do something and ongoing genocide and should not be complicity and partner of the ongoing genocide. Dokun Isa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And that's all for now. We'll see you later. As always, stay engaged.